Hello, everyone, and welcome to this presentation. I hope you enjoyed your lunch and you are ready to learn something new. This talk won't be that hard. This will be a smoothie talk. But before we start talking about anything, I really want to care about your learning, about what you get, what you take from this conference. And that's why I want to, first of all, explain what will be in this presentation and for whom this presentation. First of all, this presentation is for those who want to learn something about reactive ecosystem. I'm just curious, how many of you want to learn something about reactive ecosystem? Just raise your hand. OK, great. That's cool. You're in the right place. This talk will be useful for those us for reactor users, for those people who are already has already started uh, adopting reactive ecosystem, and this talk is for everyone who is trying to learn something about Webflux, who is trying to work with Webflux, etc. So if you are still here, if it if you fit this cr criteria, welcome. And as I said at the very beginning, this talk will be a smoothie talk. So please take your smoothie, please take your coffee or tea, and enjoy this presentation. All right. If you're still with us, let me introduce my colleague, Violetta, amazing person, Violetta. Hello, my name is Violetta, and I work at Pivoto. I contribute a lot for Spring uh, Framework. I'm the main committer behind the Reactor Neti, and I'm also a Tomcat committer and the release manager for Tomcat 7. This person knows everything about Reactor, Neti, Tomcat internals, <laughs> so you should believe her voice and her, her word. My name is Oleg. I work for Netify. I'm doing everything reactive. I am Reactor project contributor. Uh, today I'm building, right now I'm building framework and open source library called RSocket, and also I am really active contributor to my local community. So if you're curious about some conferences in Ukraine and what you want to visit and spend your time uh, really productively in Ukraine, just ping me and I will share with you some discounts to our local conferences. But let's talk a little bit about our agenda. So what we are going to do today, first of all, we will start with figuring out what we want to achieve, what application we want to build today, right? That's what we want to do at the very beginning. Then we will try to figure out how reactive ecosystem fits, how we can use Reactor Netty, how we can use Reactor Kafka, and what else we can use and we can get from Reactor Addons. Sounds good? Good to go? Any questions so far? Great, let's start. So. OK, what we have as a demo for today, first, we will use Twitter as a source of data. Then we will consume specific tweets with specific keywords. And then we will send this information to the browser as server sent events. Yeah, sounds like really simple application, almost hello world Twitter application uh, that we can create ever. And uh, basically, what you have to do right now you have to take, you have to remember, remember all the stacks. Do you see it well? J prime, J prime, 2019, J prime conf. Please use these tweets and tweet about our talk, about this conference, and share your ideas, your feedback, etc. The most active tweeters and person who is uh, tweeting about this talk, this conference, will get this book. If you want to learn about Reactive programming in Spring, this book will, will help you. So if you want to get it, tweet a lot. And let us show our, our UI application. So here we have our app. Yeah, it works. So what do we have here, basically? Here we have a map. And on this map, every tweet will be displayed as a point on a specific location. So once you tweet it, uh, we will try to figure out from which location you did that. And then we will try to figure out how many tweets you did before and uh, what is the pl what your place in the scoreboard. And in this way, we will try to create real-time Twitter-based application. So please tweet, and you will see some changes. In order to make sure that this application works, I'm going to take a look at this. For now, nobody is tweeting, so let me tweet please first. Please tweet. Yes, let me <laughs> take a photo of everyone, like this. And let me tweet something. 
this J prime tag in order to make sure it works. So J prime test. I have been doing that almost the whole day, so I will. I hope it will work right now. So let's wait a little bit, and we will see a tweet from me. Here yeah. it is. It works. So it's pretty good. I just tweeted about J prime test. That's what I wrote in my tweet, and we observed this this message here. Is it working? I guess it works. So you ensured. And yeah, you can. We will back to this application a little bit later, and you will be able to observe your tweets as well. For now, let's go to to our application. Let me quickly introduce what we have here. So we have a, this is a plain Java application. We use Gradle here in order to build it, and we have a few modules. The main one is React Net, which is just a plain three-tier application with few modules, etc. And of course, the main method. Really simple application, I guess. Everyone in this room created the similar, something similar at some point in time, so you don't have more, lots of questions regarding this app. That's why let's move forward. And let's move to the first part. So how we can build our server? You know, I want to use today Net, yes. for example, but um, I know that Net does not support reactive streams. Right, right. so we have for that proposed reactor Neti. Yes. Cool. So Actually, reactor Neti adds the necessary bridge so that you can use Neti over the reactive streams API. But you know, if we start creating Neti server, yeah, we will need a lot of time. Right. It's complex. Have, do you, did you, did, um, does anyone has have any experience with Neti? Any Neti users here? Okay, just a few hands. As you can see, only a few people are able to work with Netty because Netty has really complex API. So what reactor, how Reactor Netty helps us? Actually, Reactor Netty simplifies the creation of the server and the client, and we will show this later. Okay, so it basically hides the complexity of Netty. Yes. Okay, that's cool. And in addition, translates everything to, to the reactive types, so you can use even Flux and Mono. Okay, but this is not the main feature of, of reactive yeah, streams. Yeah, the main feature is we support reactive streams back pressure. Okay, so we support back pressure, but wait a sec. I know what is back pressure. Do you know what is back pressure? Yes, but, but do you know what is back pressure? How many of you are familiar with uh, notion back, back pressure notion? Just raise your hands. Okay, okay, a few hands. Because almost no one knows what is that. Let let us explain in in real demo in real game, interactive game, what back pressure is. So the game is really simple. Violetta has a few frogs in, he, in her hand. Do you see it? Show it again. And now she'll be throwing those frogs into me. And that's basically the game. But with one, with one rule. I will say when I'm ready. So once I'm ready, I will say, OK, I'm ready. And let's start throwing as fast as possible. So I'm ready. That's how application works without back pressure. I tried to catch everyone as fast as possible. Of course, it was really complex because I just said I'm ready. I just said I'm ready, and Violetta started throwing frogs without any control, just throwing as fast as possible. So let me show you what back pressure is right now. Now, the only difference, once I say it's, I, I'm ready, I will say, I will define how many frogs I'm ready to handle. So I'm ready to handle only one frog. Please throw it. OK, I'll put it in my packet. Throw another two, please. Here we go. And the rest of them. And here we go. That's how back pressure works in reality. Do you see it? Did you understand how it works and what back pressure is? So the main difference is that once I say it, I'm ready, I'm able to say how many I'm able to consume. And this is about, and this how back pressure basically works. All right. Let's go forward. In case you understand, understood what, what is back pressure, let's try to, to apply our application. But wait. What about Spring integration? For example, Spring Framework 5 supports uh, Neti, Reactor Neti, and also the web client there is based on Reactor Neti. 
And even Spring Boot reactive stack there, by default, now the runtime is Reactor Nati. OK, so I'm a Spring user, so I can use Reactor Nati today using Spring 5 and WebFlux project. That's amazing. I don't have to configure anything, and it will be just the default runtime for, for Spring. Yeah, you need just to specify the reactive web starter, and you have Reactor Nati by default. OK, so for those who really love Spring Framework, you can use Reactor Nati without any complexity. That's amazing. But for now, for today's de demo, we want to just use React Reactor Stack and nothing else, just plain project reactor without any Spring dependencies. So let's try to build something using Reactor. And for now, what we will do in, we will just create a Reactor Netty server, and we will consume in Twitter tweet, tweets and send them to the UI. That's what we will basically do in right now. Again, text, please tweet about us. And let me go to, to our application. So what do we have here? Basically, we have a few services. We have a service which consume messages from Twitter. Do you see it well? Can you read what's going on on my screen? All good? Great. So basically, this is not the most important part. I'm just showing that here we have some Twitter consumer, some service which allows me to integrate Twitter client with my application. I wrap it into reactive way using Project Reactor. I create a flux of messages, which is basically a stream, infinite stream. And that's it. Here I define back pressure strategy, because we are using reactive server, which supports back pressure. So I'm expecting that in case of overflow, I got an error. So it just should work. It should just work, which is fine. Now what I have to do, I have to integrate this part with Reactor Netty. So how to start using and how to build Reactor Netty server. Can you advise me? Yes, let's create one very simple server. Let's start with uh, HTTP server okay, so type. There is HTTP server in Reactive Reactor mm. Netty package. OK, that's good. So if you invoke just create. <coughs> OK, plain simple builder. You receive an instance ready for configuring. Oh, I see familiar to methods like host, so I can define local local host, and I can say port, and of course, 8080, the most popular port around the world. What else? But still, we need somehow to handle our incoming requests, right? Yeah, right. We have to define a handler. How we can do that? We have two choices, either to define some generic handler with okay. handle. OK, I see. We have a handle, which gives me a handle server request. But this is complex. I have to figure out what is the path, and then I have to define all the routing, yes, sure. routings manually. Do we have something better? Yes, let's try to use routes. Oh, yeah, I see. We have a plain route method, so let's create a consumer. Yeah, it gives me routes. Oh. I have lots of useful methods here. I can define my get. I can define file, response, post, boot, whatever. This is really useful. I like it. Since we have a streaming application, we have to create maybe a stream of messages from server to client to our browser. So what is the option to create such a stream? What do you think about WebSocket, for example? Yeah, let's, let's verify the solution by time. So let's just try use to, to create WebSocket API. WebSocket here, and now what I have to create, the function, yeah. Oh, and here, here I got a WebSocket inbound, WebSocket outbound. So and what is that? Yes, using the inbound, you are able to receive what's coming, and using the outbound, you can send to the client something. OK, so here we have receive inbound, which is basically flux. Oh, I can see that I can convert this flux to flux of bytes, buffers, input stream, so I have a plenty of useful method here to, to convert incoming stream of webs from WebSocket to a stream of bytes or whatever. That's useful, but we don't expect anything from the client, so we have to just write to, to I guess, to outbound, and let's see what outbound has here. Outbound provide us with method send. Oh, this is pretty. Let's send only yeah, the, and we the have flux stream that we have. Yeah, we have the tweet flux, which is flux of tweets, but it doesn't compile. Wait. What's wrong with that? So let's verify the API. And the API says that we have to send publisher which extend byte buff. Do you know who knows what is byte buff? Yeah, this is one, two, three persons. So for those who don't know what is byte buff, this is a representation of bytes, 
byte array in, 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 Netty, in native Netty. So this is really efficient way to, to send your bytes, your binary messages to, to the network from, from Netty. And we have somehow to convert our... Well, let's convert it, yes. Yeah, for, for, for demo purpose, we have a simplified, uh, simplified sample. We have a utility class which allows us to, to convert whatever we want like this to, to bytes, byte buffer representations. This is not efficient byte, but it doesn't matter for now. So let's just use it. Serializing utils. And let's convert everything to byte buff. And here we go. Do we need anything else apart of returning our stream back to as a result? Yes, you know, this might be an infinite stream, actually. Yes, and right. If we uh, use the default in reactor net, actually, we will not flush anything, and we wait the stream to finish. OK, so wait a second. But it is an infinite stream, and we wait to finish. OK, so wait a second. In order to, to, to flush everything that we have in stream, we have to method complete. That's how Reactor Native works by default. So once we stream it everything, every messages, we wrote them to some buffer, and then we received incomplete, and then we tried to write anything to the network. But we have here an infinite stream of tweets, which is infinite. So do we have any other options where it allows us to flush every message as it comes? Yes, you can instruct Reactor Native to flush after every message. OK, so they have some, oh, I see. They have options, and I can use some, oh, I can use send options, and I can send, oh, easy, flush on each. And now I guess it will be flushing every, messages to, every message to the network. Yes. Cool. Looks good. I like it. Really simple, but we have to define much more. So let me quickly define everything else like this. So in order to, to define your routing, you have to just do like something like this. Really easy. Just a few types, and I'll, I'll enter, right, Anton? And and can we see how it's easy to serve just server sent events here? Yeah, so basically you can use this builder API. You can follow the same functional uh, approach and define everything you want. So for example, we want to use server sent event. How many of you do knows what is uh, server sent event? So this is basically almost similar like, we like WebSocket, but only half duplex connection. So once you send a request, you, only, you can only observe a stream of events. So this is pretty useful when you want to just send messages from, from the server and ignore everything from the client. So we will use it for our demo. And here we have the same WebSocket API hidden by inside utility classes because we don't want to uh, create too many lines of code. And here is a few ways to, to handle resources in Reactor Native, which is also not complex. All right, so what do we need to start this? this machinery? Invoke just bind okay, and block so it. This will just start the HTTP server. OK, so we just call blind in order to start everything because we are ready, and now we have to block. OK, that's, that makes sense. So once we blocked, we got this guy, this disposable server. OK, let's just try to run this and figure out whether it works or not. And what happened? Do you know what happened? I don't know. Zero. Yes, it's finished with second code zero. That's obvious. But why? We just okay, started the it server. Just, just started the server and exited the main method. Oh, right. We have to keep the main thread working. Exactly. We have to, 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 to keep it until we terminate our server. Yes. So yeah, OK. We have to use another approach. Here we have some asynchronous API. So. Let me just quickly cheat here and do something like that. So here we accept the disposable server. Disposable server has method or yeah, method on dispose, which return another mono, which I guess will be handled, will be completed only on ter server termination. Yes, sure. Yeah, along with that, the disposable server has access to host and ports, so we can display everything on this on the log. And of course we have to measure the startup time because it's important, right? We are we care always, about. We always measure the startup time, right. right? Yeah, this is really important today. So let's just run it and figure out how fast is that. Hooray! Do you see it? 
less than a second, just 200 milliseconds or 300 milliseconds. This is really fast to start. So let's go to, to our web UI and figure out whether it works. Yeah, it works. I like it. So let's see what's going on on our UI. So why no one, no one is tweeting? Tweet, come on, come on. Just, just tweet about the success of the successful startup of our application. This is important. <laughs> Otherwise, I have to tweet another test, test tweet J Prime. Ah, here we have. Oh, one. hooray! We have some tweet. Thank you, someone. And here is mine. Yeah, and, and lots of other. More. Okay. Great. So it works, which is pretty good. So let's go back to our application. And let's summarize what we saw. So what I learned? First of all, I learned that Reactor Metis really high performance server solution, which is basically a better wrapper around Neti. In turn, it's easy to create server sent events, and it's really easy to route everything in the same functional manner. And what is the most important, it's easy to build business logic because now we are operating using Fluxes and Mono. And Fluxes and Mono provides us better API, which allows us to really simple, in, in really simple way create everything and date every data process in our application, which is cool, I think. But wait, we, we still have a problem. The problem is related, I guess, to big pressure because, yeah, I guess, yeah, this is too early. Yes. <laughs> okay. T can you tell me a little bit about the state and the future? Okay. Let me summarize what we have uh, for Reactor NetES of today. We just released our uh, current stable version 0.8.8. Uh, the next to be will be 0.9. What we support, UDP, TCP, and HTTP. Uh, HTTP for the server. And even with the latest stable version, we have um, better performance, better memory usage. And for 09, we plan even more performance optimizations. Uh, also for 09, we plan HTTP2 for the client. And uh, the, one of the most important things is actually out of the box okay. metrics. That sounds good. So first of all, we will have once we have an HTTP client, H the client which supports HTTP2, we will be able to create only one connection and send everything in one connection, which is really efficient for source usage. And of course, this is really important to have metrics because today we are building really huge microservices solution, and it's important to figure out what's going on inside yes. every small service. Yes. That's why metrics is also really important. But as I started, what about back pressure in Reactor Net? If we are going to look at our application, we have a Twitter stream, right? We, we are streaming, we are consuming messages from Twitter. And this is a streaming Twitter API. We just ma push messages. They don't have any, any way to, to say how many messages we want to consume from Twitter. And we have this reactive solution like Reactor Net, which supports back pressure. And I guess something can went wrong. Can you explain maybe how back pressure works? Maybe we can't control this Twitter stream without any problem. Let me explain. OK. So, so you have here Reactor the maintainer, Reactor <laughs> native maintainer, explaining how back pressure works. Yeah, we have here the TCP as a transport. Then Wait a sec. How many of you can understand what's going on here? OK, just a few hands. OK, let me explain it a little bit simpler. Back pressure works something like, yeah. It, it, it somehow works. Let's believe her. It works. And um, the main problem that can happen in our application, as I said, that our Twitter app can overflow our Reactor Netty server, and everything can bend down. That's what could happen. Because we can handle too many tweets. Our application has just a small capacity. We are running everything in, in cloud with a small number of uh, memory and CPU, so everything can then down. And let me show what could go wrong. Let me add a few plain parts into my code like this. So let me delay every message, every tweet, to some few seconds or maybe hours. So let me duration of days. Let me delay every tweet on a day. Why not? I can do that. 
let's put a capacity in order to reproduce the problem. So what do I, what do I have here? Uh, seems correct. What's wrong with that? Yeah, I have to return then return initial tweet. And yeah, this will be fine. So for here, let me tune a little bit my app in order to make it more sensitive. Not here. Maybe where? Yeah. Here we go. Yeah, he here I have to put one concurrency. And now let me run everything. So now you have to crash my app. Now you have to tweet a lot right now. So it started. Let me reload my app. Now you have to tweet really a lot. Like you have just to tweet to tweet to tweet in order to crash this app. We won't be waiting for that. We will be back to the state of the application a little bit later. And now we will just continue. So you can tweet in background, and we will figure out whether this application will survive or not. Right? Yes. Oh, it's crashed. Oh in real time. So what's happened? We got overflow exception. Do you see it? Is that what could happen? And in real application, we can overflow by messages our application because Twitter just push messages. And this is a problem. Yes. Yeah, this is a problem. Let's stop it. And let's go back to, to, to our app. Yeah, let's go back to this slide. So I have a question for you. Do you know any solution which we can use in between our Twitter app and our reactive server in order to preserve stability of our application. Do you know anything? What do you usually do when you do kind of uh, design in your application? How we can handle as many messages as we want? Uh, yeah, we have to put a message queue. Do you know any efficient message queues? Kafka? Yeah. Why not? We can put, put, put Kafka, why not? In every solution, in every um, unclear situation, just put Kafka in between somewhere. <laughs> so this is how it works. All right. But do we have any reactive adapter around Kafka? Mm, I think we have reactor Kafka. Yeah, yes. Yeah, we have reactor Kafka in our ecosystem. So. Let me basically explain what Reactor Kafka is. The main idea of Reactor Kafka is absolutely the same as the idea behind Reactor Netty. We want to provide Reactive Streams API for Apache Kafka. We want to hide the complexity of Apache Kafka producer and consumer API. And we want to handle everything with back pressure. That's the most important. So we want to put our Reactor Kafka in between. And now it will work in the following way. Our Kafka will be consuming messages from Twitter. It will enqueue them, because Kafka is elastic storage. It's almost super scalable. And then once we are able to consume messages, we will say, OK, now please send me that number of messages. And Kafka will provide us and messages. We will process them and send to the UI. That's how it will work with Kafka. So it's a pretty good solution, right? Yes. So let's take a look how we can use Reactor Kafka in our application. Let me quickly switch to, to the next stage of our, for our demo. And now we introduce it another module, which is Twitter Reactor Kafka Adapter. What we basically did once we moved to new, to new commit, we basically moved everything related to direct data consumption by uh, from Twitter. So here what we have here we had Twitter for G integration and it migrated to, to, this, to this app. So here we have the same application. This is absolutely identical app and identical way to consume messages. But now what we want to have here, we want to consume messages and send or, or send it to Kafka producer. On the other hand, we want to consume messages from the different side, from our Reactor Net application. And here we have another adapter around Kafka. So we want to consume messages here. So let's start from producer, from producer side. In order to, yeah, let's start, yeah, from here. In order to start working with Reactor Kafka, you have to use two, two classes. The first one is sender, sender, Kafka sender, right, this guy. And you have to create Kafka sender. It's really easy. Kafka sender, you have to, of course, supply some options. 
And there is some API like sender options, but I don't want to specify any every option, so I have a pretty useful configuration in my application like this, which defines at which port should I send my, to which kind of broker should I send my messages, what is the client ID, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a list of configuration in my application, and I have a utility class, Kafka Commons, which allows me to say, okay, I want to load all the configuration from Kafka properties. That's what I want to do here. This is basically it, and now I simply have to call send method, really easy, and of course supply my publisher, which is the result of my tweet's consumption. So this is my publisher. Of course, as with React or Netty, Kafka has its own API, which requires to send me a sender record, so this is a representation of, of every message to Kafka, so I have to, to map every message. Um, Something like this, raw tweet, and that's basically yeah, raw tweet. And that's basically it. So in a few words, what's going on here? I map my raw tweet, which has a particular ID, which has some content, to producer record. And producer record specify to which topic I want to produce messages. This is simple. The next wrapper is sender record wrapper, which basically takes a producer record and, they say, and then say, okay, here is some additional correlation ID and metadata which allows me to figure out whether my message was sent or not. This is also really useful information, but we won't go too deep, too deep inside this stuff and we will just say, okay, we want to send messages and block, of course, our main thread in order to keep everything working until the end of Kafka stream. This is really simple. Okay, let me format this. We won't, we won't uh, try to run it because I have the same application running in the cloud in order to avoid any, any kind of pitfalls and hidden mistakes, etc. because everything could go wrong. You know, this is demo, and demo gods could be really angry on us. So let's just take a look how it works on the opposite side. Now we have to figure out how we can consume messages. In order to consume messages, we have to use almost the same API. This is almost simple, uh, the same simple as, as Pi. So let's go to use Kafka Receiver right now. Kafka, Kafka Receiver, here we go. We have to create Kafka Receiver using the same, almost the same way. So we have to, to use Kafka Consumer Setup. This is a little bit tricky because now we have to specify what type, type of messages we, uh, we expect from, from Kafka. So this is basically raw tweet messages. We are using the same API in order to consume Kafka properties for our Kafka receiver. And now we have to specify which topics do we want to listen. Do you see it? Here we specify the list, the, the list of topics to which we want to connect and listen for our messages. This is the initial setup of our Kafka, uh, Kafka receiver, so receiver options, and here we have bar our Kafka receiver. And now once we done that, once we have done that, we have to simply figure out which, which, what kind of uh, acknowledgement or what guarantees we want to set up in our stream. So for example, we want to auto-acknowledge everything or we want to have really fine grinded configuration and say at most one or exactly one message should be delivered to me. So this is a different uh, kind of quarantines for our stream, but we will use just a simple one. We will say, okay, since every message, since every record that we receive should be committed back, so every record has kind of receiver offset, which should be committed somehow, we, sh we should call it. I'm quickly use a cheat shortcut here in order to commit my offset and then return the same record, the value inside my record back. So that's basically what we have to do with Kafka receiver. Really simple, right? A few lines of code. And finally, in order to run my application again, I have to use now, now my Kafka Twitter stream service, and that's basically it. So not like this. Let me just 
clear to do message. And now let me run it. So we are starting our application. And yeah, it's starting. Looks good. So, and it connected to, to our Kafka server, which is remote server. So we got an acknowledgment that everything is pretty fine. And we started receiving some tweets. So let's go back to our UI. And let's try to figure out whether it works or not. So yeah, message is coming. Do you see it? Lots of messages. I like it. Great. So it works. Now let's go back to our presentation. And let's do a quick summary. OK, what we saw actually is that we can use uh, Reactor Ka uh, Kafka with uh, Reactive uh, Streams API. It is easier to consume and send messages to Kafka. There is back pressure support. And we have a resilient application. Yeah, basically, you can check back pressure because we haven't uh, um, directly exposed that back pressure works. But you can check out the code. We will show the link to the source code. And you will be able to try it at home and ensure that back pressure works properly. But now, the, the next question is that along with Kafka, along with Reactor Native, which, is, which must be non-blocking and reactive implementation right, of uh, wrapper around existing solution, we have a few more components. right? I remember that before this talk, we just uh, wired and integrated, uh, make a proper integration with Mapbox, which allows us to enrich some location based on the Twitter content. So, so in order to show all these tweets on the map with proper location, we have to somehow figure out what is the location of this tweet, right? So we have to figure out where, where you are. Yeah, I, I remember that in some cases we do not have the longitude and the latitude for the location. Yeah, so we have to, in many tweets, we don't have a proper location, so we have to go to Mapbox and ask, can you, can you say at which, at which point it, on the map it was uh, tweeted? So we have to figure out the location. And of course, after all, and reach the location and display everything on the map. But now we have a few problems. And you may ask, what could go wrong? First of all, we have lots of external libraries. For example, like uh, Mapbox, right? This is an external library. What and kind of HTTP client it uses for the As far as I remember, class. they use Retrofit and OKHTTP. And I'm not sure whether OKHTTP is non-blocking uh, implementation of, uh, of the transport. Mm. So it, it could be really blocking. And we don't know how it works. And the question how to figure out and how to ensure that everything is non-blocking. Because non-blocking is really important. Who knows why non-blocking is really important? Just raise your hand. OK, for those who don't know why non-blocking is really important, I will show you a simple, really simple case. Just imagine that you have one thread application, not JS application, simple application. So here we have a timeline of this one thread. Just imagine that we just accepted an HTTP call, like we did, an HTTP call to external service. We know that the execution and processing of this call takes some time, right? Yeah. So every call lasts that much time. And now let's take a look at the blocking approach. In the blocking approach, this execution time exactly mirrors and reflects as a blocking time of your thread. So it means that during execution of particular HTTP call, you won't be able to process anything. Really? And only after completion of this call, you will be able to execute another HTTP call. Do you see that positive execution is, takes this much time? And awaiting of the response take this much time. This is a problem because we will can kind of we can use uh, this thread in mu much more efficient way. Can you show us? Yes, of course. In contrast, non-blocking approach is much more efficient because in this non-blocking approach, we have to say, okay, we just executed the call, we stored somewhere a promise, a future to the result, which will kind of once it happened, once we got a result, it will be completed or we, we will get a notification. It doesn't matter. And we won't block any thread. We will be able to accept another call and execute another HTTP call, which could go to another server. And we will be able to process all this call in parallel, which will be much more efficient. Do you see? It? We, ex we spend our time really efficiently right now. And the latency will be much lower. Yes. That's why we have to use non-blocking everywhere. But now the question is, I'm not sure, how to figure out where, whether 
every component is non-blocking? How to investigate it? How to figure out that every component is non-blocking? Actually, do you know that we have such two in Russia? Really? Yes. And how it's called? Blockhound. Oh, that's cool. Have you ever heard about Blockhound before? Just one hand, two hands. Okay. So, can you explain what blo Blockhound is? So, Blockhound is a pure Java agent. So, it instruments the JVM classes and then intercepts the blocking calls when they are made from threads marked with non-blocking operations. On, that that sounds good. So basically, we can attach it to our application and then figure out what, what calls are blocking, what, where we have uh, kind of causes of blocking operations. And we d even do not need uh, a load. With just one request, we can understand what's yeah, going on there. Yeah, that's good. So let's, let's just try and uh, kind of try to find out where we have blocking executions. So let's go to our application. You told me that this is Java agent, right? Yes. A Java agent. So I, as far as I remember, I have to somehow configure my GVM setup. I have to put additional properties. I guess I have to Google. And how to get this Java agent, I guess? This, we have to download it from somewhere. Now, this is too complex. OK, let me show you. OK, do we have any other options? Yes, yes. First, we, you, we need the dependency for oh, the block count. So we can bring it as a dependency to our project. Fortunately, I have already uh, had it. I got it, it before. So what you have to do is, is to bring this one dependency to a project. And as I understand, it brings uh, some additional Java API in order to, to enhance our runtime. Yes. OK, so how can I do that right then? I guess we have to start with static method, because yes. this is the beginning of everything. And for f as a first step, we can just install Blockhound. OK, so there is a block. OK, Blockhound. Oh, I see. We have Blockhound installed. Easy. Yeah, that's all. Let me rerun it, and let's see whether we have something blocking in our application. Oh, we got something blocking. And yeah, we actually, we got it's this. not uh, my box, actually. So it's what is that? Else. What is that? Where is that? Where is the root cause? OK. No, I don't see. Uh, this is how stack looks like in reactive programming. This is not good. OK, we, we got some lock park. And where is that? This is something strange. OK, let me just rerun it. This is something unexpected here. We yeah. found another block call. Yeah, we found it. Oh, no, I guess this is this, oh, this Kafka. But yeah, this is just initialization. So this is a constructor. This is fine. So it, it doesn't matter for execution, because this is just yes. an initial execution of Kafka. So it could block your thread. This is fine. I, I don't care about this one blocking. So how can we put and how we can ignore this? With the API, we can actually add our additional so instructions. They have, they have an API. Oh, I see. So mm -hmm. what I have to do, I guess, I have to create block count integrate. Oh, I got a builder. and. Yeah, this bl yeah here is pretty you can lead. specify that uh, Kafka initialization is OK for us. Yeah, so let's allow to our Kafka constructor to be blocking. So, and I guess it's this, this, that's it. Yeah, and let's let me try run it. it. And I hope this time it will be much better. OK, I missed one comma. So, works, please. My Kafka, reactor Kafka, is super amazing. Yes, it works. No. No. <laughs> Again, this is a close call, but before the close call, we got another blocking. Oh, no. Too many blockings. Uh, so what is the root cause? The close, the close. Yeah. OK, we have to ignore close or worker call. Oh, this is Kafka consumer poll. I didn't know that poll is blocking. Actually, How many of yours of your knows, did know that poll method is blocking? Sometimes it's blocking. Yeah, it depends, but it's not good, really. It's this, this is not good. But you know, I, I think I remember there is an issue in Kafka. Yeah? Recently reported about this blocking call. Oh, that's, so we, we don't have any other choice rather than just ignore it again as yes. the previous blocking cause. So let's just put another allow blocking and Let's continue our life. Because for now, it's the most interesting whether my, my box is blocking or not. And we are still not there. Yeah, we are still not there. This is just an execution of Kafka. And we didn't get 
got any, we didn't get any messages so far. So let's just restart this guy and see whether it works or not. Uh, this is another vertical. Oh, uh, here. Um, yeah, thank you. So let me restart it. And now, yeah, it seems, again, B b wait, Kafka consumer close. Okay, let me let me just ignore everything from Kafka. <laughs> let me ignore the whole Kafka. That's but actually, good. you can see that uh, it is very easy to find uh, the blocking cause for your third-party libraries. Right. So what you can do at the real application, you can run your tests, and then you can again. It shouldn't work like that. Again, another block. Ah, too many blocks in our application. Ah, actually, it is OK, HTTP. Oh, here we go. We found out that OK, HTTP client is blocking. So here we go. And this is actually something strange, because before the demo, we didn't have a chance to find that this is blocking. But now at the demo, exactly right now, it's blocking, which is good. So we figured it out that HTTP, uh, OK, HTTP is blocking. So for this demo purpose, we will just avoid block count because we don't want to fix any issues. But yeah. what you can do, for example, you can do reactor netty or uh, reactor Net HTTP, netty client. Cli HTTP client in order to replace OK HTTP in, or, in, in your uh, HTTP calls for your HTTP calls, right? Yeah, and it, actually, it's very easy. Yeah. To do that. So we we will just skip this part and we will go back to 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 our summary, to our presentation, and we will make a quick summary. So what we, what we just learned, first of all, non-blocking is really efficient, uh, really important, because we want to, non-blocking is about efficient resource usage, and if you want to build really efficient application, you, you should, you must, use everything in non-blocking way. Finally, you can really easy figure out what's, what parts of your application uh, are blocking, uh, using, for example, block hound. And this yes, is cool. you can integrate in your test or validation phase for the application and uh, be sure that yeah. there is no blocking code, yeah, even as, in as the as third-party libraries. Yes. Cool. Finally, what we can do else? Do we have any other options and any other options in, in order to improve our application? Because if we are going to, 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 to look at our schema right now, we have Mapbox, we can see messages from Kafka, and on every tweet, we are going to map box, make a call, and then send a proper tweet with location, right? So on every tweet, we will be going to map box. We will spend our money because map box is, is appropriate our solution. And, and I have a paid account, like a normal account, which will consume money from my credit card. Mm. And I don't want to spend that much, that many kind of, that all of my money on map box. So can we, how, do you know whether we can somehow cash the results because I, I'm pretty sure many calls are done from the same location, so we can reuse the same location and the same uh, coordinates in order to coordinate, in order to display our tweets on the map. What about the cache functionality in reactor extras? Yeah, I heard that there are reactor. There is reactor Kafka, reactor extra project, and reactor extra project basically brings a few addition and superset of operators on top of reactor core. So first of all, it brings tuple utils. This is just utility, simple utility class. When you have to, for example, zip your stream, you get a tuple, which is representation of left and right stream. So you have to get T1 and T2. And this is somewhat a um, 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 bad style of code or something yes. like that. It's, it makes it unreadable. So what you can do with tuple, uh, tuple utils, you can say, OK, please. Uh, decompose my tuple into separate parameters and execute my function as I have two parameters. And that's how it, it's, you can do that with tuple utils. Then you have mass flux. For example, if you want to do some mathematical or math operation like uh, sum, etc., you can use mass flux and calculate average, sum, or whatever you want. And finally, we have swing integration. This is really important. Everyone today using swing. And finally, we have cache utility. The cache utility is the most important part here. So in order to start using cache utility, for example, we want to use cache mono. You have to specify, first of all, a map from which we want to consume some cached results and in which map we want to store this result, and the key. So this is basic 
the, the essential of uh, cash mono, for example. And once we missed the key in the map, we will, the cash mono will automatically does an external call and invoke an external service, and after all, enrich our map by some data. So how it works, basically. We will make the same tweet consumption from Kafka. Then we, we will check the, whether we have the key inside cache. In case we don't have anything, we will store the result in cache. And after all, we will put it onto the map. In case we got another tweet with the same location, for example, we will go to the cache, and then we will consume the location from the cache. Easy. Let me Can quickly show? show how it works. A few final steps we have done in order to let me switch to the final point. No, not to this one. Yeah. But let me quickly go to my map location, map box location service. Here I have cache mono. I have method lookup, as I have shown. So I'm quickly use a shortcut here again. Caching. Here I created a cache mono. Of course, I have to use a particular tweet in order to figure out whether uh, by which location should I look up the tweet. And in case we found something, we will take it from map. Otherwise, we would have to execute the previous, the normal call. And that's basically it. Not like this, but yeah, like this. So that's all. That's all steps you have to do in order to start using cache mono. In the same way, there you can use cache flux. There is cache flux, which provides you a cache on infinite stream. But this is a little bit different story, and uh, we are good with, with cache mono. So let's just rerun our app and make sure it's working as before. OK, it's working. So let's reload the content. It works. And yeah, we will observe the new tweets at some point in time. So let's go back to our slides. To summarize, reactive ecosystem is really huge. And this is just a small part of Project Reactor. Because a part of Reactor Cache, Reactor Extra, Don'ts, and uh, other projects that we mentioned before, there is lots of others. There is our socket project, which, which is end-to-end -end reactive streams on top of particular transport. This is application reactive streams protocol. There is integration with RabbitMQ. There is integration with Redis. There is reactive relational database access. So today, you can use reactive everywhere. And this is really cool. We have end-to-end -end reactive ecosystem. We can build really complex applications without any problems. And finally, we can build really efficient application at the same time. This is amazing. Some resources that you would like to, to learn, everything you saw, you can find on uh, official documentation of Project Reactor. This is basically what you have to, to take a look first. And now, the price time. A few last minutes to, to figure out who is the most active person on this Twitter. OK, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> this is pretty good. Uh, do we have Eugene Dimitrov here? You're the winner of this book, buddy. I hope you will enjoy it. Enjoy it. And we have a few small prizes to the rest who, to the rest of the audience who tweeted. So, Harry Alex Alexeyev, are you there? OK. Nikola Gichev. OK. Does anyone see his name on, on, this, on this screen? <laughs> Mark, where are you? I don't see him. I, I can't see. I can't find Mark. So just, just raise your hand. Who else? Apply back pressure. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So thank you for your attention. This is basically it. You can find the source of presentation by this link and the source code by the link down. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>